Far too often, treatments and policies are developed to address cancer, not the people living with cancer. Friends knows that centering patients, their needs, and their quality of life can inform better research and change the trajectory of science. We're looking to the future of cancer care, bringing patients and their advocates to the table, making them partners in leading the charge. Our work, advocacy, and expertise is driving groundbreaking legislation that gets patients the treatments and care they urgently need faster than ever. Clinical trials historically have been restricted to a small number of patients. We're broadening eligibility criteria in cancer clinical trials to make them more accessible and equitable. Diagnostic testing can be inconsistent and variable. We've brought all players to the table to make sure tests are accurate so that personalized medicine can truly be precise. Too little information was being used from real-world patient experience to inform treatments. We're creating a new paradigm to shape how therapies are developed. And now we're charting a path for the next generation of breakthroughs. Breakthroughs like our CT Monitor project is one of the largest scale scientific endeavors in Friends history. To assess the ability of a rapid and easy to use blood test to monitor treatment response. We're setting the standard for a new biomarker for use in immunotherapy, which will support informed decision making for patients. We are transforming lives and we'll use these 25 years of momentum to drive even more life-changing breakthroughs for years to come. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Allen, President and CEO of Friends of Cancer Research. Welcome to the second day of this year's Friends of Cancer Research annual meeting. Each year, this meeting brings together expert stakeholders to address current challenges in the development of new medicines. As noted in the video introduction, many of these discussions lead to ongoing collaborations aimed toward developing solutions. Thanks to all of you for taking time out of your schedules to join us, and a special thanks to the working group members who have been regularly meeting over the past several months to develop the white papers that you should have received in advance of the sessions today. If you were unable to join yesterday's session, on the use of CTDNA as a drug development tool in early stage disease, the white paper is posted on our website and the video from the discussion is on our YouTube page. Our annual meeting topic today will start with the topic of maximizing benefit and improving tolerability for patients through dose optimization. To start us off, I'll hand things over to Atik Raman from the US FDA, one of our working group members to discuss the white paper topics today. Atik. Thank you, Jeff, and good afternoon. It's my privilege on behalf of the working group members to introduce today's topic, provide some background on the issues at hand and set the stage for our panel discussion. So why are we here? We have recognized that the traditional dose, up, dose selection strategies used for the development of cytotoxic therapy persists in the era of targeted therapy and results in dose that is mostly not tolerated for long-term use and fails to provide the benefit of the therapy. Today, we are here to discuss a pragmatic, holistic approach for dose op finding and dose optimization for cancer drug development and have a commitment to work together in advancing innovative strategies for dose optimization for cancer therapy and for our cancer patients. Over the past decades, life-changing therapy, such as targeted therapy, immunotherapy, and CAR T therapy have revolutionized cancer treatment. Multiple modalities are available for our patients. However, the prevailing mindset in drug development is more is better. It's loud and clear from our patients that the drugs are too toxic, and the physicians are tied to the dose and schedule in the package insert. That provides a reality check for all of us. Dose optimization remains a pitfall in the development of cancer therapy. The maximum tolerated dose defined by dose limiting toxicity used for the development of chemotherapy persists where a disease is defined by a target 
and a product is developed to interact with these targets. MTD approach most of the time ignores consideration of target engagement, resulting in off-target toxicity. Trials include few patients at each dose level and have short observation for DLTs and lacks the collection of safety information beyond DLTs. These results in dose reductions, dose interruptions, and dose discontinuation in clinical trials, and some time can cause irreversible toxicity in some patients. In essence, approved dose may be poorly tolerated, affecting the quality of life and depriving the full potential benefit of a therapy. Optimizing dose in cancer drug development is not a new concept, a topic, or a conversation. In November of 2013, Friends and Brookings held a conference on clinical cancer research supported by ASCO and Susan G. Komen for Cure. The conference included industry, NCI, ASCO, Cancer Center, Cancer Research Foundation, and FDA. The brief from this conference recognized that balancing the benefits and risks of cancer therapies is critical in order to provide longer survival while maintaining or improving quality of life. The key to achieving this goal is identifying the right dose. The panel at the conference was charged to address what data needs to be collected to optimize dosing, how these data can be used to optimize dosing, and when this data should be collected. The brief laid out a path how dose finding and dose optimizing trials can help selecting a recommended dose or dosage for registration trial. The brief proposed dose comparison trial which is not typically done in oncology and promoted implementation of patient reported outcome in clinical trials and encouraged development of real world data. Subsequent to this conference from 2015 to 2017, FDA and AACR organized three workshops to address those finding oncology drugs. In 2015, the workshop focused on improving the dose optimization for small molecules. In 2016, the workshop focused on all drugs, including biologics, and had robust discussion on non-clinical models for efficacy, ER relationships, modeling and simulation for dose finding, and design for dose optimization trials. In 2017, the workshop focused on approaches to combining to combination therapy and best practices regarding patient and dose selection, biomarkers to aid patient selection, and novel endpoints that can define patient benefit. In addition, there have been numerous publications, commentary, and presentations from experts in various disciplines, including clinical, clinical pharmacology, statistics, regulatory science, patient advocacy, and thought leaders in oncology. Recently, FDA published in New England Journal of Medicine a perspective that highlights drug dosing conundrum in oncology and when less is more may be the answer to benefit patients. The time has come when we need to walk the talk. Although we have seen unique approaches to dosage optimization, but these are largely isolated. We have made remarkable progress in our road to cure cancer. Imatinib, the first tyrosine kinase inhibitor approved in 2001, improved five-year survival rates for CMO patients from 31% to 89%. Ongoing research and investment holds enormous promise to address the unmet need. Comparison of two decades shows significant progress in providing new hopes to our patients. Not only more drugs are available, but newer drugs 
have better advocacy, providing longer survival. Patients deserve a more tolerable dose. So what exists? In 1994, the International Conference on Harmonization published E4 guidance that provided guidelines for industry to generate dose response information to support drug registration. E4 guidance described the centrality of dose response in establishing a new drug as safe and effective. An adequate and controlled dose response trial may allow for the approval of a range of dosage and serve as a primary evidence of effectiveness. The guidance also emphasizes that conducting dose response studies at an early stage of drug development may reduce the number of failed phase three trials, speeding the drug development process and conserving development resources. We need to fully embrace this principle. However, there is a disconnect and that is why we are here. I, on behalf of the contributing members of the white paper, like to uh, thank friends for organizing this meeting and bringing stakeholders from patient advocacy, industry, academic, and FDA to discuss opportunities and find strategies for optimizing dosing in cancer drug development and treatment. The white paper articulates two perceived challenges. First, those finding trials are too time consuming and prevents patients from getting the drugs that they need. And second, the stakeholder believes that lower doses are not effective as higher doses. So we are looking for pragmatic solutions that includes dose optimization without impacting expedited and rational drug development. We need to balance between any loss of effectiveness and a tolerable dose that provides a long-term benefit to all patients. Efforts for dose optimization should start with understanding the basic pharmacology and pharmaceutical property of a drug through non-clinical development, uh, identify targets and evaluating target engagement and developing biomarkers will facilitate dose optimization in clinical settings. Early clinical investigation should not only include dose finding based on MTD, but also conduct a dose comparison trial. A holistic approach should be to analyze all non-clinical and all clinical data to move forward a tolerable dose or dosage for registration trial. Consider population PK and uh, exposure response in registration trial to confirm the selected dose. Dose optimization should continue post-marketing as the drug is investigated as a monotherapy or in combination in other stages of a disease or for other indications. Balancing our goals to continue expedited cancer drug development and provide long-term benefit of a therapy with a quality of life to every patient we have shared responsibilities. FDA needs to provide guidance, facilitate regulatory pathway for interactions with sponsors, and support innovation in dose optimization trials. Industry needs to conduct adequate dose optimization trials during drug development and timely interact with the FDA to resolve any dosing issues. Patient advocacy needs to communicate patients' expectations in public forums, such as professional society meetings, social media, and other platforms, and help patient participation in dose optimization trials. We need to provide not only hopes, but a therapy, an option, by moving away from the MTD in favor of leveraging an optimal dose that improves patients' quality of life, and they will be given a gift of a better life. And now we will move to our panel discussion with our working group, and I will pass the discussion to our moderator, Dr. Mark Rutain from the University of Chicago. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Atik. And I, I want to thank uh, Friends of Cancer Research for supporting this event and making it possible. And of course, the entire working group, and most importantly, our panelists who you will hear from over the next half hour. So I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. Uh, we have Lokesh Jain from Merck. Lokesh is a clinical pharmacologist. We have Ann Lozier, who's a patient advocate. We have Marat Shah, who's a medical oncologist at FDA. And we have Lori Strong, who's a regulatory scientist advisor. And so I'm gonna let uh, Ann take the first question uh, to really talk about why this whole effort is important to patients. Thank you, Dr. Retain. The obvious consequence of identifying and leveraging the optimal dose instead of the maximum tolerated dose is that patients with cancer will experience fewer and milder treatment-related side effects. That is seemingly straightforward, and yet the implications are profound. First, in the clinical trial setting, attrition may decrease because participants will experience less severe side effects. In the real world, the results may be that patients with potentially curable cancer whose treatment is limited may no longer continue to endure ongoing side effects such as neuropathy. And as for patients with incurable disease, who will remain on treatment for the rest of their lives, there are several implications. First, these patients may no longer need to skip a scheduled treatment or completely stop a working treatment as often as they do now. Second, their need for acute care, such as emergency room visits, may diminish. And finally, these patients may not suffer as many or as severe cumulative side effects as they proceed from one treatment to the next. This in turn may allow them to take full advantage of the complete list of therapies that are available to them instead of opting out of treatment prematurely because their bodies can no longer withstand the toxicities. Thank you, Anne. So uh, I, I wanna ask Lokesh, um, this puts clinical pharmacology front and center. And uh, how do you think you and your other colleagues in the industry will perceive the new Project Optimus? Yeah, th thank you, uh, Dr. Ritain. And, and uh, from a clinical pharmacology and a drug developer's uh, perspective, uh, I think there are significant advantages of early dose optimization. Uh, and that can be of great value in long term within that product development cycle. And I will highlight a few. Uh, so first of all, it helps in understanding the therapeutic window of the drug and the understanding of range of concentrations within which efficacy is maintained without added unacceptable toxicity can be of great value in further optimization of dosing regimen. For example, uh, less frequent dosing from Q3 to Q6, it can help with alternative route of administration such as IV to SC. It can inform doses for combination trials and, and, and so on. And it, beyond uh, these benefits from the dosing regimen perspective, uh, by doing dose optimization in pre-market setting, or early in the development, it, it reduces the risk of clinical holes or post-marketing requirements on dose optimization, uh, which can be of great uh, benefit because there is a risk to those PMR trials showing lower doses as efficacious as higher dose, and that can potentially have consequences on other aspects such as pricing. And finally, uh, you know, I'll add one more thing that, uh, you know, from a differentiation perspective compared to other compounds in the drug class, uh, we have seen uh, an example that was released yesterday of a KRAS inhibitor where lower dose um, was as efficacious as higher dose. 
uh, and could potentially differentiate from, from competitors. So there is there are numerous benefits uh, within the drug development cycle uh, by having this dose optimization achieved early on. Thank you. So uh, there's going to be concern and hesitancy for lack of a better term in the industry to, to do this. And the biggest concern will be around timelines. And so Lori, um, as, as a regulatory scientist, how do you think this will impact timelines and, and how will you encourage those involved in the drug development plans to uh, re respond to this new FDA guidance? Thank you, Dr. Otain. Um, as we all know, in oncology drug development, to the extent possible, we try to use tools to ex expedite development, such as breakthrough therapy designation and accelerated approval to try to get drugs to patients in need as fast as possible. So there's definitely concern that if we have to do larger dose finding studies, and it will take more time and it will slow that approach. But we have to look at the overall picture. Um, one, if it's clear we have to do dose optimization, we can interact early with the FDA, even at the pre-IND stage to um, make sure that they agree with the approach we're taking. Um, we can do efficient uh, phase one, two trials where the phase two part can be randomized to two or more doses uh, instead of trying to do two separate trials. Um, it would be less efficient. Um, as Lakesh already mentioned, um, going into the registrational trials, if we have an optimized dose, we're less likely to be put on clinical hold by the FDA if they don't agree with the dose we've, ch we've chosen. Um, as already mentioned by Anne, once the patients are on trial, they're more likely to stay on if the dose is uh, more tolerated and that increases the chance of um, a positive outcome coming out of the registrational trials. And then ultimately, um, during the review of the NDA or BLA, it could go more smoothly if there are fewer questions about the dose. And um, obviously, if we want to have a very fast um, path forward, uh, we can dose optimize in the post-marketing setting with a post-marketing commitment or requirement, but that's not ideal because once the drug's on the market, it's harder to enroll patients. Um, ultimately, if we find the dose that is in the original label is not adequate, we have to do a label update. So overall, doing dose optimization early just makes a more efficient process to get an optimal dose into the labeling um, and to have the right dose to patients as fast as possible. Thank you. Murat, there, there may also be perception that FDA will not be able to respond to the many questions from industry related to Project Optimus, and that that will have an impact on timelines. So can, can you address that, please? Sure. Thank you for the question. So I just wanted to uh, emphasize that it's extremely important to plan for the dose optimization strategy early and for drug makers to really view dose optimization as a key component of establishing that a drug is safe and effective. And from our end, we are very interested and very open to providing feedback on dose optimization plans starting extremely early in development, including at pre-IND meetings before the drug has even been given to a patient for the first time. We are, of course, very interested and very open to updating these recommendations as more data from the development program becomes available. And so we really encourage drug makers to consider their dose optimization strategy early and discuss these plans with us at the relevant milestone meetings. Um, and I just wanted to um, just reiterate one more point, which is that there are huge advantages to paying attention to dose optimization early. First and foremost, it really increases the likelihood that a trial intended to lead to drug approval will be successful. This is a really um, key, key component of that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So I, I wanna move now to the specifics of, of how this might happen. Um, and uh, there's a, been a lot of questions as to whether randomization is going to be important here, or can we use the good old oncology approach of just parallel uh, sequential cohorts and then try and draw some conclusions? Um, Lokesh, do you want to address that from your perspective as a clinical pharmacologist? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, so I think one of the most important thing in dose optimization from my experience is uh, randomization uh, of at least two dose levels or more. Uh, 
uh, we have seen that non-randomized comparisons uh, for, for multiple reasons, um, biases because of intra-trial uh, variations or between site variations and how patients are selected can result in misleading conclusions. And we have seen that in our own program of pembrolizumab. So uh, I, I think it is very important to keep that uh, randomization aspect in mind. And therefore, some of the approaches uh, that have been suggested, uh, like using backfill approach for dose escalation trials or window of opportunity studies, may or may not be sufficient and, and, and more likely may not be sufficient to really address that point. Thank you. So we have a question from the audience in regard to drugs that have been previously approved and for which a sponsor uh, is submitting a, a supplemental or, or seeking to submit a supplemental new drug application. Murad, can you comment on the uh, context of Project Optimus in regard to new indications for already approved drugs and particularly those in which there may be some uncertainty about whether the label dose has been optimized? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I wanted to um, reiterate that the focus of Project Optimus right now is really um, emphasizing the importance of dose optimization early and as a component of pre-market drug development. Um, for the question about you know, how this might apply to products that have already been approved, I wanted to bring up the point that just because, you know, in addition to uncertainty regarding the labeled dose for the given indication, a dose for one indication may not be the right dose for a different popu patient population, particularly where that drug will be used in combination with other therapies, and particularly where there may be concerns related to overlapping toxicities between multiple products. And so in those instances, the FDA may require uh, or, or ask uh, drug makers to look at um, additional dose optimization as part of their development plans for that, for that next disease setting. I hope that Thank answered part of the question. Thank you. So I have another question for Anne. Anne, do you think patients will have any concerns about being uh, about enrolling in a trial in which lower doses than are maximally tolerated are are being considered? Thank you, Dr. Retain. I believe some patients will have a concern. And to this end, I think we could utilize a two-pronged approach. First, enabling patients to have information about the efficacy of lower doses, for example, in other drugs where they're comparable to the standard dose, I think would be very helpful in overcoming that paradigm. And secondly, if clinical trials were to allow crossover such that a lower, more effective dose that's found to be are uh, very viable as the trial proceeds, could attract more patients to that arm. That indeed could definitely attract patients to enroll in the trial. So first is the data, and second is the crossover. Thank you. So there are also some questions coming in about uh, the sample size that may be required for these randomized trials. Um, and I'm, I'm first going to ask uh, Murad to address that, as well as Lori, from a regulatory perspective. Sure. Thank you for the question. So I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, why is the FDA saying that these dose optimization trials are so important? And it's really so that uh, when the patient gets the drug in the clinic, they can get a dose that's efficacious and also safe and tolerable, such that they can stay on the drug as long as they're experiencing clinical benefit. And to achieve this, uh, we are em emphasizing the importance of dose optimization to really understand dose efficacy and dose toxicity relationships. And within this overall framework, it's really randomized trials are a really important tool to help us understand these relationships and support what would be a good dose of that drug. And so the purpose of randomization is not necessarily to establish that one dose of the drug is superior to another 
another dose in a statistical way or establish statistical non-inferiority between the two doses, but really to have trials that are sufficiently sized so that we can interpret these dose efficacy and dose toxicity relationships and use that information to guide overall decision making. From an industry perspective, I know I get questions all the time about you know, what's the magic number the FDA wants, <laughs> the number of patients for particular things. You know, there's no hard and fast rule for this. Obviously, as, as Marat said, it has to be enough patients that you can get some meaningful results about um, the two doses, but it doesn't have to be statistically powered. Um, and again, you know, in the interest of, of speed, we would want to minimize the number of patients, but make sure we have enough patients to get meaningful data out of it. So I think each drug, you know, the mechanism of action, what's known about it has to be looked at um, to make the decisions about how many patients would be needed for that kind of a comparison. Thank you. So hopefully we've conveyed a strong impression that dose randomization is gonna be critical. But of course, the next question then is, how do you choose the doses for the dose randomization? And so uh, Lokesh, do you wanna, Try and tackle that one. Yes, yeah, sure, uh, definitely. Thank, thanks for the question, Dr. Redin. Um, so, first of all, we need to really um, carefully look at the information from preclinical data or in vitro experiments uh, to really, and as well as the information from dose escalation cohorts, and do a integrated PK-PD analysis or PK, PK biomarker analysis to pick the doses which has a good potential of therapeutic activity, the lower dose and higher dose potentially maybe the MTD dose and do comparison of those two doses. In addition to information for that, uh, you know, your own molecule, you could also leverage information from other compounds in the drug class to identify the benchmarks for exposures uh, that may be clinically uh, you know, efficacious and use that information to pick the lower dose. So the key is really to use all the information uh, to benchmark or identify the lower dose, which has um, maximum chance of efficacy, and then have another dose, which is MTD dose, and do a randomized comparison uh, to establish a therapeutic window in order to inform the dose for registration trials. Thank you. So there's going to be a lot for the stakeholders to digest here. And I, I think uh, what I really want to now talk about is what we need to do as a group and to, to make this happen. And so Anne, as a patient and an and a, uh, outspoken advocate, what can the patients do to, uh, to make this happen? And, and what do you see as the the obstacles from a patient perspective in the context of, of patients seeking investigational drugs? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Thank you, Dr. Attain. From a patient perspective, I'd like to address the paradigm that a higher dose of a cancer drug employs greater efficacy. I personally used to believe this. And actually, I insisted on being given the highest dose of a chemotherapy drug that was available at the time when I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer. But yet after conducting further research, I read reports that concluded that a lower dose of specific drugs could be as effective as the recommended starting dose. And an example of that would be the next Monarch trial regarding Virzenio. We need to be aware, however, that patients are beginning to share their experiences on social media relative to lower doses and their outcomes. So there's already definitely an awareness, but the question becomes, what do we do with the awareness? Because awareness is not enough and only some patients are aware about doses and their efficacy. I believe that a strategic database solution, data-based solution is warranted. It would entail providing information about the efficacy and toxicity of various doses, not just to patients, but also to healthcare professionals through education materials, 
medical training materials for HCPs, and perhaps one day even incorporating these data into the package labels themselves. We already talked about attracting patients to clinical trials, so I think we've covered that in a prior discussion. But at this juncture, I'd like to mention that all of the patients who I've heard from regarding the movement away from the MTD have been uniformly supportive. And finally, I'd like to share how one patient superbly summed this up. She simply said, hallelujah. Thank you. Um, and now, I, I want to let Marat also address this, but not wearing her FDA hat, wearing her hat as a medical oncologist who knows very well the dogma that is prevalent among medical oncologists regarding dosing. So, Marat, how do you think our colleagues, both at academic medical centers, such as Johns Hopkins, where you trained, and, and oncologists around the world are going to respond to this new push that less is more? Thank you for the question. And I'll answer this question wearing my not only my medical oncologist hat, but really my supportive oncologist hat. Um, which is to say that I think this, this type of focus on dose optimization is long overdue. Um, I spend, I think I've shared with the working group, I spend a lot of time talking to patients in the clinic about all of the toxicities they're experiencing from treatment, particularly diarrhea. And it's, you know, it's uh, very impactful in terms of quality of life, but really is necessitating dose interruptions and a lot of time away from therapy. And so I really think that this this emphasis on dose optimization is long overdue um, and really will allow patients to stay on therapies that would be otherwise working for their tumors for much longer. Thank you. And, and Lori, how do you think the uh, your colleagues in the industry, particularly those that are more focused on the commercial side of things will respond to this new emphasis on dose optimization? Well, I can say we already have an internal working group um, to figure out a framework for dose optimization for our early projects. So we have embraced this. We got the message loud and clear from the FDA earlier this year. Um, as far as the commercial aspect, it's, it's a good thing. If patients can stay on treatment longer, then that ultimately is a good thing commercially as well. So they shouldn't have any issues with it. So I, I think it's a good thing overall. Thank you. And Lokesh, do you see any obstacles from the perspective of, a, of the clinical pharmacology community? And how will smaller companies manage that really don't have access to experienced clinical pharmacologists such as yourself? Yeah, so uh, I will answer it in both ways. So one is from clinical pharmacology perspective, but also as a drug developer uh, myself. I think the biggest uh, perception or challenge is speed, that drug optimization or dose optimization can somehow slow speed. But there could be creative trial designs which can minimize the delay of how drugs are reaching to patients. And there are robust scientific methods for us to really demonstrate and understand how these new drugs uh, not the cytotoxic drugs, but the targeted therapies work. And that information should be uh, leveraged to communicate that lower doses are equally efficacious and more, more tolerable uh, compared to higher doses in many instances. And there are many examples now to sort of reinforce that message. And from the perspective of, uh, you know, smaller companies or larger companies, um, managing this, um, I think once the FDA sets out expectations clearly and really require this information to be included in, in interaction pack packages, companies will figure out a way to, to sort of integrate this information uh, through internal or external resources uh, to really uh, create those robust, robust packages necessary for discussions with agencies. Thank you. So 
it, there is still going to be many communication opportunities and not every company is going to see this webinar and those who hear rumors of this will simply respond well there's no guidance yet and this is all perhaps just a hoax so marat how how can we respond to the notion that this doesn't apply to all drugs and all uh new drug applications. Thanks for the question. So as has been reported, the FDA is working on a dose optimization guidance for oncology drugs, which will um, provide general advice and recommendations, which would be broadly applicable across development programs. And kind of within that overall framework, we are very interested in working with stakeholders and makers of individual drugs to figure out ways to apply those general recommendations to their specific development program and strategies to do so. Um, so this is this is coming. Thank you. And Anne, do you have any thoughts on the implications of Project Optimus for uh, the practice uh, of oncology from a patient perspective. What, how do you think patients are going to respond to the notion of less is more? Obviously, we want patients to receive effective therapy, and we're hearing that new drugs are going to be labeled optimally, but we also want to make sure we don't have an overreaction where patients suddenly start saying, I hear less is more, and I'm going to cut my doses on my own. Can, can you respond to that? Yeah, I think that is a very, very important point. I believe that it's important all throughout treatment, not just when a patient experiences side effects and talks with their doctor about dose reduction, but also when they begin a new treatment to talk about dosage. And a dialogue involves two sets of ears and mouths, right? So I believe it's not just important for the patient to begin to raise these issues with their doctor, but also for the oncologist to raise them with the patient. The information, as I said before, about the efficacy of lower doses is going to be a key point. Today we have that information, but probably most patients don't know about that. I believe we could start sharing these data, not just with oncologists, but also with patients, because as patients see the information in terms that is readily understandable, they will begin to share confidence about it, to have confidence about it, and share their information with others as they're doing today. Well, thank you. The patient gets the first and the last word. So uh, I am thank, thank the entire panel and I'm gonna turn this over to Jeff Allen again. Thanks so much, Dr. Attain, and thanks to the full working group for your expertise and time over the past several months and for today's discussion. I'm very excited now to welcome and introduce our final session featuring an update of programs and priorities with key leaders at the FDA Oncology Center of Excellence. I'm pleased to turn things over now to FDA OC Director, Dr. Rick Pazder. Dr. Pazder? Thanks. For the invitation uh, to come and talk to you about what's going on in the OCE. The OCE was founded in 2017, and I really want people to know what we've been doing since then. Uh, I was originally asked to uh, participate as a solo person discussing with the audience what we're doing, but I thought it would be better to have the people that are actually doing the work. So I've invited the key people, our executive leadership here at the FDA. Uh, Center of Excellence, Oncology Center of Excellence to participate with me. One of my biggest pleasures in life is to work with really talented people. And people frequently ask, Rick, why did you stay at the FDA for 22 years? And it really was because of the people. And many of these people that you'll see here, I have worked with for more than a decade, and I really consider them more than colleagues. Uh, more than friends, 
and really part of my extended family, so to speak. So let's have some fun here, guys. Okay, we have four people and let's rock and roll and get some excitement here. So I'm gonna ask each one of you to come online and just give us a brief uh, description of what you do at the OC or in the OC. Paul. Sure, um, thanks, Rick. My name is Paul Klutz and I'm one of the deputy directors in the Oncology Center of Excellence. As Rick said, I've been at the FDA for now over 10 years and have done quite a few roles starting from as a clinical reviewer. My, my general programs really focus on evidence generation. They focus on trial efficiencies and um, different kinds of outcomes that we can measure. So I have, I started up a program in patient focused drug development, which is really looking at patient reported outcomes and making them more rigorous. It actually feeds in pretty nicely to the, to the session we just heard from Marat. I think we're really starting to try to figure out how to use PRO with an objective in mind. And I think tolerability makes a lot of sense. And so I think we can get a lot of information from PRO and those finding. Another uh, important uh, group that we're leading now is OCE's Real World Evidence Program. Um, I was lucky enough to recruit Donna Rivera from the National Cancer Institute to run that program. This is really exciting. She's been a nice addition to our, our OCE family and she's hit the ground running. I'd say the two most important aspects of that program right now are to really identify a way to measure real world response rate. And we are working actually with friends on trying to explore that as an endpoint. It's so important in single arm cohorts to have a, a response rate endpoint so that we can look at efficacy. The second thing is we're gonna work with Reagan Udall and identify ways to really understand real world data um, as far as uh, optimizing our understanding of the metrics on data quality. How is it fit for purpose for specific regulatory objectives? So those are my two main programs. I guess I'd end by saying that all of us wear you know, many different hats and we hold positions actually within Cedars Office of Oncologic Diseases. And all these programs are actually doing many consults across the therapeutic centers. And that's really um, in step with the OCE's mission to sort of create a consistent clinical review for all oncology products. So it's been pretty exciting. Okay, Paul, thanks for the brief introduction. Let's go to Mark next. Is he available or did we lose Mark? Yep. Hi, my name is Mark Gary. Can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. So uh, I'm a medical oncologist and uh, one of the uh, deputy center directors of the Oncology Center of Excellence. And uh, you know, the programs and projects uh, uh, that I'm responsible for is, you know, as Paul had uh, uh, finished up with, you know, one of the major charges for the OCE is coordinating the clinical reviews, you know, for oncology products across centers. And one of the programs that that I'm uh, uh, very interested in and, and oversee is that program that coordinates the clinical reviews for the Center for Biologics projects, uh, products such as you know, CAR T's for uh, treatment of patients with cancer, for example. Another program uh, that had really led the charge for many of these innovative um, mechanisms for evidence generation is the immune oncology uh, uh, field and immune oncology program. Um, so it's been a very important aspect of bringing forward novel novel paradigms for evidence generation to support approvals. Uh, other aspects uh, that we can get into uh, uh, time pending uh, that I'm very interested in moving forward is a regulatory science research group and OCE, uh, and then specific projects looking at uh, dosing, which we heard a lot about uh, this morning, Project Optimus, uh, as well as a budding project on thinking about the evidence generation paradigm for combination regimens. And this has been really brought to the fore with the anti-PD-1, PD-L1 antibody space and thinking about the PD-1, PD-L1 resistant or refractory setting and, and trying to target those mechanisms of resistance. Uh, and then lastly, uh, one I would like to highlight as well is Project Catalyst, which is a new project in time to, intended to provide education and guidance on early oncology drug development with a focus on the academic life uh, uh, science uh, innovation hubs as well as small, small pharmaceutical companies uh, and really pushing forward novel uh, therapies that really have the chance to, to uh, move the needle for patients with cancer. Great, Mark. Let's go to Julia next. Thanks. So hi, I'm Julia Beaver. I'm a medical oncologist and chief of medical oncology in the Oncology Center of Excellence and acting deputy director 
in the Office of Oncologic Diseases. And uh, my primary focus is oversight of the solid tumor drug development programs and a number of the, the related projects. Um, I also have particular interests in precision oncology and was very excited to be a part of the Friends of Cancer Research Circulating Tumor DNA Working Group that was presented yesterday uh, at this annual meeting. Julia, we had uh, co-authored a paper on accelerated approval uh, several months ago, and uh, any updates on that? And uh, I know people are very interested in, by the way, who came up with that term dangling accelerated approvals? What idiot came up with that? <laughs> this was another one of Rick's brainchild, obviously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yes. Uh, I mean, as you know, we are always evaluating our accelerated approvals, but recently we conducted this in-depth review of the anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1 antibody accelerated approvals, given really the accumulation of that large body of evidence, identifying the 10 dangling accelerated approvals, so-called because they had confirmatory trials with results that had not or did not verify benefit. And since that, uh, initial evaluation, seven of those 10 have been withdrawn or are planned for withdrawal Two remain in uh, ongoing discussions and one was converted to regular approval in a narrowed indication. And I think this evaluation, uh, which included six advisory meetings really highlighted a number of issues related to the accelerated approval uh, program. First being, as we wrote in our in our article, the need for assessment of the treatment landscape if a drug's confirmatory trial did not verify benefit with a continued unmet need for the indication. Also uh, discussed was the concern regarding the use of single arm low response rate trials for anti PD1, PDL1 agents to support accelerated approval. And we're discouraging this approach uh, for future applications. And finally, the evaluation highlighted the need for the confirmatory trial, the really critical role for that confirmatory trial to be well underway, uh, if not fully enrolled at that time of that accelerated approval action. Thanks, Julia. And just for the folks that are on this, uh, obviously, we're not done with the review of that program. Uh, we have several ODACs coming up uh, this year, uh, looking at people, uh, looking at sponsors that uh, have ongoing commitments and also uh, plans for a, an annual review of these accelerated approvals, especially in those uh, cases where we have another new regulatory term, delinquent accelerated approvals, meaning uh, accelerated approvals that are ongoing uh, dis, uh, and have trials ongoing post after their regulatory commitment deadline, the date that was in their approval letter. So uh, this is going to be an active area for the OC CE to look at. Uh, stay tuned during the next year, basically, for other updates on this. And in addition to that, Julie, we should mention the website the that you launched. Absolutely. So we've created a new project, also named by our, um, our visionary uh, uh, marketing uh, expert, Rick, um, called Project Confirm, which is an initiative to promote transparency of outcomes related to accelerated approval for oncology indications. And this project uh, is meant to provide a framework to foster discussion, including an associated public website, which lists in a sortable format all the oncology accelerated approvals since inception 30 years ago, including those that have verified benefit, those that have been withdrawn, which is less than 10%, and those that are con that are ongoing uh, with their accelerated approvals, the majority in that were approved in the last few years. Thanks, Julia. Let's turn it over next to Tammy. And Tammy has been with me since the very beginning. And I think all of us on this call would say that she has been the cohesion and the cohesive glue that has formed the everyday workings of OCE. So when the rubber meets the road, really it's Tammy Kim that's running the place, so to speak. So let's turn it to Tammy. Tammy, tell us what you do. Oh, I don't know if I would say that, Rick, but, but thanks for the introduction. 
Um, I've been with the FDA for about 15 years, and I think I've been with um, with Rick in setting up the OCE and multiple reorgs for the um, Office of Oncologic Diseases for the past couple of years. But what I'm primarily responsible for are setting up or even smoothing out regulatory review programs within the OCE. So I have a group of senior regulatory project managers and health scientists under me, and they're basically um, assigned to major projects within the OCE. So if you, you name it, if you, you have project renewal, we have dose optimization, we have project confirm, and um, all of these senior health scientists are assigned to these projects and provide advice from a regulatory perspective and even implementation of these programs. We also have a group of health scientists under me that work on guidance and policy development. So any guidance and policy coming out of oncology and the OCE, um, chances are it's been coordinated by our group uh, in conjunction with the clinical and uh, other multidisciplinary team. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tammy. I, I think it's important to, for people to understand, it's very easy to have an idea, okay? But to get that idea into reality is a, a difficult task and requires a, a great deal of really talented people. And here again, uh, we have the leadership here uh, on this call of OCE, but behind us, so to speak, are a great number of people. And I would like to acknowledge them and they include the team leaders, the project managers, our clinical pharmacologists, our toxicologists, our, our statisticians, manufacturing people, safety people, drug advertising people. There's so many components to the FDA and all of these have to fit together for these programs to come to some fruition and actually become realized and actual programs that actually affect people's lives. I'd like to kind of turn it over to kind of a roundtable discussion at this time. And um, what is your favorite program that we've had at the FDA here? So um, who could be my first victim here? Julia, what's your favorite program that we've been doing? That one's tough. There are a lot to choose from. Um, like asking what is your favorite somebody child? Else's, but I'm going to go with uh, my, my favorite program because of really the scope and the global um, interest and scope has been Project Orbis, just seeing the way that we are able to do these collaborative reviews with other regulatory health authorities. Um, and, and the, the way that our review teams have been able to dialogue and discuss scientific issues during the review. We are still responsible solely for our decision making, but um, it has been really a great, a great collaboration and has allowed many drugs to be approved earlier in other countries than they otherwise may, might have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and here again, uh, he's not here, but uh, Angelo DeClaro runs that program. And although it was originally a, a vision that I had, I really have to uh, thank Angelo for really taking this on and really uh, pushing the program forward, providing the interactions between people. And I hope I don't miss any of the countries, but we're doing it with Canada, Australia, Singapore, uh, the UK, uh, Brazil, Israel. I hope I didn't miss any, but it's really expanded. And really, this is a program meant to provide uh, really access, timely access to important drugs uh, worldwide. And uh, I, I came to me, the idea came to me kind of out of the blue, so to speak, on uh, on a Monday, on a May day, so to speak, when I was walking. And I discussed it with the staff and it came to fruition. But here again, you need people really to implement the program. And here again, not only does Angelo really spearhead the effort, but a longtime FDA employee, uh, Diane Spellman also has been with him uh, and has coordinated much of our international activities, including our monthly telecons with a whole host of regulatory agencies, including the EMA, Swiss Medica. In fact, I forgot to mention Swiss Medic uh, is a, pro, a partner in Orvis. Um, and here again, this requires a great deal of talent to really get these programs on. What are some of the other people's favorite programs? Paul, I kind of know what yours would be. Actually, I'm going to throw you a curveball because I'm thinking about the newer programs that might have huge impact uh, where there's just a lot of, of difficulty. And I think Project Catalyst has got a lot of opportunity because you know, here we have really small companies, um, you know, trying to, to bring 
bring very unique and challenging products to the market. And it's uh, not only small companies, it's actually investigators. Yeah. Too. And, and so having, sure. having the FDA help, help them understand how to navigate, I think could be really impactful. And some of these products are also very, very exciting. So I don't know. Well, Paul, you surprised me because, you know, I thought you were going to say patient focused drug development because that, well, I mean, that is, that was the program I started. There, I will tout that Vishal Bhatnagar, because we're, we're kind of telling everyone about all the people that are really making this happen. But Vishal Bhatnagar, I gave that program over to, has done a really nice job, um, you know, really starting a website that we can put patient reported outcome data on, Project Patient Voice, as well as getting a guidance through that really provides a roadmap for patient reported outcomes. So that program's actually done really well this year, too. So. Yeah. And Mark, how about your favorite program? Oh my gosh, where do I where do I start, Rick? I mean, it it is uh it is actually hard to pick pick a uh, winner, like you said, uh, favorite. Kind of like, what is your who uh, is your favorite child? <laughs> I, yeah, that's uh, that's not a possible you know question to answer. However, you know there's 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 a lot of great programs. Uh, you know, one of the, the programs near and dear to my heart right now is is the safety program. Uh, Abby Nair is uh, uh, leading the charge uh, with that and and growing a very important program in oncology safety. Uh, other programs that are important, uh, regulatory science research, and and uh, of course uh, 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 pediatric oncology program. And uh, you know, I will say, you know, the immune oncology program is 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 probably one of the the, the uh, ones that you know I have uh, seen and and been part of from the the get go. You know, both as a uh, uh, investigator, a basic science researcher back in you know the late '90s when. The, the immuno-oncology group uh, would meet in that uh, basement uh, uh, meeting, you know, and, and have, you know, a few chairs and, and seeing it move into the plenary sessions of the prof major professional society meetings and being part of that, you know, as FDA has been important. And, you know, one of the projects I wanted to, to highlight, uh, you know, as my new favorite project right now, Rick, is the, you know, is the uh, uh, Project Optimus. Um, you know, I really, uh, uh, I uh, think that, you know, there's been some innovations that have happened as part of the immuno-oncology paradigm, you know, such as seamless oncology uh, uh, trials, you know, this concept of using an existing trial architecture to, you know, really address in, in different cohorts the discrete drug development objectives necessary for uh, uh, the evidence for an approval. Uh, you know, calling thousand patient plus uh, trials as first in human phase one trials is obviously you know, misnomer, but I think, you know, this sets the backdrop for, you know, these other efforts that, you know, come about, you know, that are very important, you know, really move the needle. Uh, you know, this project Optimus, for example, that we talked about today is shifting away from the maximum tolerated dose as the default dose for, for selection of an oncology drug and, and moving towards dose optimization, uh, uh, you know, characterizing a range of doses uh, to maximize efficacy while minimizing toxicity. This is a real paradigm shift, a potential game changer for, for patients. Yeah. And I think what is not often understood is that this is not a new concept. You know, this has been something where other therapeutic areas, it's an expectation and it's done. Yeah. Uh, and, and as part here of the again, I think, development. I think, you know, we have to ask ourselves when we see drugs that we approve and even in the pivotal trial where a significant portion of people have dose interruptions, and I'm talking about greater than 50% or greater than 60% having dose modifications, do we have the right dose? And all the comments in the last panel, just to build on them, I'd just like to spend some time on this is the issue of building a house on quicksand, basically. The dose is the foundation and to have an understanding of that is so important. And this idea of mm -hmm. speed, it is important. We have addressed this and hopefully Tammy might talk about some of the programs such as RTOR, et cetera, that attempts to speed up drug development and uh, review time, but speed is very important. However, it can't be at the expense of really the foundation of drug development. And we have seen folks, and these are not necessarily public, but major, major issues with uh, dosing and really uh, 
situations that have come back and haunted sponsors basically with demonstrations of actually inferior survival. It's probably because the drug was simply just too toxic and resulted in unforeseen drug toxicities. Uh, you know, many times we approve a drug on a single arm trial and we really can't look at overall survival uh, in a single arm trial. And then when we do take that to a uh, randomized setting, we have seen some very unpleasant situations with sponsors having to potentially withdraw their applications from the market here, so to speak. So I'd like to just quote, you know, poor Richard's almanac, haste makes waste, so to speak. And I think that nothing uh, illustrates that better as this concept that you really have to have the right dose and to try to build a drug uh, program on a shaky dose, so to speak, is really like building a house on quicksand. Tammy, let's turn to you. What's your favorite program? So yeah, I think um, that's also a hard question for me to answer because in some respect, I'm kind of involved in the background in many of these, but um, I would agree with Julia. I do like Project Orbis because um, it allows us to have a global impact in providing uh, drugs, cancer drugs to around the world earlier to patients, which has not been done before. Um, and it's a effort that was a brainchild by you and the OCE have led, so that's very exciting for me. Um, the other um, project or program that I'm pretty closely involved in and I like because probably because I'm closely involved in is Project Facilitate. Um, many of you may know, this is also Dr. Pedger's uh, brainchild as well, but it's a program to centralize intake and review of expanded access requests. And the reason why I like this is um, one, we can conduct research centrally and we can really also help oncologists and their healthcare team through the whole expanded access process, but also with the opportunity to directly impact patient care um, from the FDA right to the patient. So that's something that um, I like as well. And since we've started Project Facilitate in 2019, we were able to help a lot of oncologists. We get a lot of feedback, great feedback coming from outside stakeholders. And we were able to cut review times down from about two to, um, to about one day. The other exciting um, update from Project Facilitate is that we started a public-private partnership with NYU's uh, Public School of Health. And we're working with uh, Dr. Art Kaplan as well as Allison Bateman House on expanded access research within um, oncology. So for me, that's one of my favorite programs because of the activity within that, within that program. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that we really brought forth Project Facilitate, and here again, we had this idea many, many years ago before the uh, foundation of the OCE, but really with the creation of the OCE, we had funding really to institute it within the center of the OCE, the Oncology Center of Excellence. But, you know, although people that use uh, the um, expanded access or single patient I, uh, IND process, uh, if you use it frequently, you understand it. There's many stakeholders here, including the patients, the physicians, IRBs, the drug company, the FDA. And to get all these people coordinated on the same page is somewhat of a daunting task. So it's a issue that we really uh, wanted to address. Uh, it's there uh, and people should uh, have access to it. Uh, one of the programs that we haven't talked about is really streamlining the review process. And uh, as people who know me, the uh, one thing that I hate the most in government is bureaucracy, redundancy, and just a, a oppressive bureaucracy, so to speak. So we looked at really our tour, uh, the real-time oncology review to really cut through for breakthrough therapy products and really important products, how to get these applications approved in the uh, as in an expeditious manner without really cutting corners in quality uh, and in analysis. And Julia, you've been really involved with that and on a hand to a, a uh, you know, day to day basis. So what, what's your feeling about the RTOR program? Sure. So uh, RTOR, I think we've had it now for um, uh, the second year, and it has absolutely facilitated our early access to data sets, early ability to review and to really identify problems earlier on, which then 
facilitates efficiencies down the road as we get into the, the um, review process. And so that has been, I think, a really transformative uh, addition to our arsenal of expediting drug development. And along those lines, we've also been evaluating the breakthrough therapy program in Project Beyond Breakthrough led by Martha Donahue at FDA and initiated uh, about a year ago. And, and that program um, had a number of multidisciplinary meetings throughout the year, culminating in a public Friends of Cancer Research meeting in September to discuss the project with uh, some delineated ideas in, in a white paper. And we're working on the next steps for that to include some pilot snapshots uh, for breakthrough therapy products to have companies submit a two to three page uh, high level um, information regarding a specific aspect of drug development such that may be rate limiting, such as dose optimization or manufacturing to, to help um, really uh, continue the impact of that program as well. And, and getting along with this theme of basically kind of cutting down paperwork, uh, et cetera, we have the assessment aid uh, and also our abbreviated packages for the uh, advisory committee. If you want to just mention that those before we move on, Julia. Yes, sure. So the assessment aid, which is also a great um, uh, combination with our tour because it allows for a unified uh, review template. So the company will submit their, their, um, their data, which is not really up for that much interpretation, then their interpretation of their data. And then we are able to add an FDA, our interpretation of the data to have one unified review document that is then submitted um, you know, into the record as, as our, um, during our review. And so that has helped streamline a lot of the efficiencies. And we have a similar document for our advisory committee called Point Counterpoint, which allows us to um, present one briefing document for the advisory committee to cut down on, on duplication and, and show our, our thinking alongside of the, the company's thinking. Okay, well, uh, I see in the chat box that our time is about up. Okay, so I'm just going to leave it by saying uh, I really thank Friends of Cancer Research for this opportunity. Uh, most importantly, when I came to the agency in 1999, uh, there were about 10 medical oncologists, and now we have almost 100 medical oncologists, and we patterned uh, really our review divisions along the same uh, kind of matrix that major cancer centers have with disease specific expertise. And I think that this is one of the major uh, areas that have helped us to facilitate both recruitment of high quality people, since that's how academic medicine is organized, as well as uh, really uh, facilitating review and the development of drugs uh, since these diseases have become quite complicated. Here again, uh, both Mark and I just recently, in fact, the last hour interviewed a candidate. And one of my greatest pleasures, again, is really to see uh, the high quality of medical reviewers, uh, medical oncologists, pediatric oncologists, radiation oncologists that we have basically uh, in the uh, agency. And I, I really have to really congratulate, you you know, uh, the team here, uh, the OCE leadership, uh, who will carry on my work after I am gone. And that's why I really want to make sure that they have the lamplight here. Not that I'm planning on retiring folks, so don't uh, take out any, uh, any insurance policies on me, uh, so to speak. Uh, so I'm going to wrap it up by just saying thank you for a truly uh, a delightful half hour, and I hope we gave you a glimpse at what we do at the OCE. Since its formation in 2017, I think we've been really active, and I'm sure the U.S. taxpayers have gotten their value out of any dollar they spent on the OCE. So I'll turn it over to Jeff. Jeff. Thanks so much, yeah. Dr. Pazner, and thanks for that 
outstanding overview. Uh, we very much appreciate this group of FDA leaders joining us today. And thanks to the whole OCE teams for their effort and continued leadership in driving the field of cancer research forward. This concludes our final session. And thanks to all of you for joining the meeting over the past two days. We're grateful for your time and continued collaboration. I also wanna thank the remarkable team at Friends of Cancer Research that have led the working groups over the past few months and made this entire meeting possible. Over the past several months, it's been a great opportunity to have these venues be available to reach many more people in their virtual format. But we certainly do look forward to seeing many of you in person as we move into 2022 and continue to advance many important projects in the coming year on behalf of people with cancer. Thank you so much and take care. <laughs>